Today, we're going to consider what goes into defining your wildlife management goals and objectives. The first step is considering your land ethic. I like to think of the land ethic as your North Star. As you embark on your land stewardship journey, your land ethic is gonna help guide you in the decision-making process. All right. Your ethics are how you live your life. So your moral responsibility of good or bad. So whenever you're thinking about the land ethic, it's the same thing. It's how you live your life on your land, how you manage your land. So you think you'll go fishing in this pond one day? Yeah. With granddaddy? For the most part, people are gonna manage their land for the good. I would first begin by reflecting on your relationship with nature and your land. We all have a relationship with nature, whether we've really explored it or not. So this species right here is actually a verbena species. It's really good for pollinators on the rangeland. It has a nice flower on it. We call it Sweet William. I've never heard that before. Sweet That's William. That's a common name. That is beautiful. You think about why you love your land so much. You bought that property for a reason, whether that's recreation, hunting, ranching, whatever the reason is, you care about that land on some level. So your land ethic is gonna reflect that. When you are out on your land, consider a couple of things. What do you appreciate about it? What value does it have to you? Do you value the aesthetic beauty of it? And does it hold recreational opportunities? Or is your value in your land spiritual or could it be cultural? Kind of considering these different things will help you gain clarity on where your land ethic lies. And it's really the first step in exploring that for yourself and your family. An ecosystem approach to wildlife management is considering every aspect of the ecosystem and how everything in the ecosystem interacts with one another. And then using that knowledge to apply it towards your management objectives and techniques. It puts habitat health and function first. This is kind of the pinnacle of wildlife management because it takes into account the whole system rather than just its parts. It's important to learn about the ecosystems that you're in and the animals and plants that exist on your properties. Because if you think of the word ecosystem, it's talking about the way that everything connects in the environment in the first place. So it's important to understand how all of those things connect in nature. Otherwise, you're not gonna be able to manage those things effectively. The four elements of habitat are food, cover, water, and the spatial arrangement of how those things are made up on the landscape. Habitats are the balance of these four components and your wildlife that utilize your property are adapted to the specific conditions that you'll find in your ecoregion. Observation is important because you need to know what's on your land. So in order to do that, you need to be out there on the property observing what do you see, what do you not see, and use that information to apply that towards your management techniques. Spending time with your land will accomplish two things. One, the observations that you take on your land will help you learn about the wildlife that use it and how it interacts with the habitat that is on your property. Second, it'll also tell you a lot about yourself and your family. It'll help you discover what it is about your land that elicits certain responses in you. Does your land make you excited? Does it inspire curiosity? Are there aspects of it that you find fearful that you need to explore and learn more about? These are all things that can be achieved by doing some observations on your property. Baseline inventories can be something as simple as just making a list of the plant animal species that you're observing on the properties. They can consist of a little bit of observations as to do you see browse lines on your browse species, which may be an indicator that there's too many deer. You can look at the plant diversity that's across your property. Now just keep in mind that this is just a snapshot in time wildlife use our properties differently throughout the year. So the wildlife that you see on your property in the spring might be different than in the winter. 
being able to take that baseline inventory across that first year on your property will be very helpful in informing your management decisions moving forward. Second, it can also help you compare your management that you do in the future. For instance, if one of your goals is to increase the presence of grassland songbirds on your property, then being able to compare the number of grassland songbirds that are present after your management to before your management can be very helpful in determining success. There's a lot of apps that are available nowadays that help you determine plant ID, animal ID, iNaturalist is a really great app and that a lot of people use. It's more of a community of people that come together that try to ID plants and animals, help other people ID plants, animals, insects, all kinds of things that you can do off of there. Seek by iNaturalist is another common one that has recently come out within the past few years that you can use to find plant ID in real time by just taking a photo. Another app that I particularly enjoy is Merlin. Merlin is a bird identification app using sound to detect the different birds in your vicinity. This is one that I have found great joy in because it'll oftentimes pick up birds that I can't really hear, but it's a great way to gain that presence absence data for your baseline inventory. Another really fun app is called Nature Tracking. This is an app that identify the different tracks that you might find on your property. A lot of times we don't actually get to observe wildlife in real time, but we see what they left behind. And Nature Tracking is an app that can help you identify what those visual signs are and who left them. So whenever you're thinking of your management goals, you wanna consider your limiting factors or the things that are not present on the landscape. So to do this, you need to look back at the four habitat components that we talked about earlier. So the food, water, cover, and the spatial arrangement of those things. Then determine what species you're trying to manage for. Are those habitat components present on your property for the species that you're trying to manage for? Some personal limiting factors can include money, time, tools, personnel, things like that can all influence the types of management strategies that you implement on your property. Size can be a limiting factor for certain species that require a large home range, such as deer. If you have a 10 acre property, odds are deer aren't living and dying on your property or spending their whole lives on your property. However, that doesn't mean that you can't manage 10 acres for wildlife. There are still a lot of wildlife species that utilize smaller acreage properties. So you can make that an oasis for those sort of species. It could be a songbird oasis, a pollinator oasis. After considering all these aspects, you need to articulate your management goals and objectives. Your goals are what you want your property to be or look like. This can be a very broad statement. Your objective are how you will achieve these goals. The goals that we've established for this property are based primarily on our land ethic, and that being that we are stewards of the land. We seek to improve it, not just maintain it, but to improve it and leave it better than when we found it from the standpoint of both the land, the soil, the water, air, and the plant and animal life. We're trying to increase the biodiversity of the ranch so that we can better support a whole host of species of birds and insects to increase the overall health of the ecosystem. Part of the 1D1 process is identifying targeted species that you're gonna manage for. I like to say that you are managing in the name of those species. You must be managing for either a permanent population, a wintering or migrating population of wildlife that are native to those areas. Pick a suite of species that one, interests you, that gets you excited, that inspires that curiosity in you, 
and also can be a proxy for other species in your habitat. For instance, managing for quail is a great species that is also going to be managing for a whole suite of other species on your property. Same thing with songbirds. If you manage for songbirds, they share habitat with a bunch of other species that are native to the area. So managing for songbirds will also manage for those species as well. Whenever you're thinking about determining what management practices you're going to implement on your property, you want to make sure that it's something that is actually going to benefit the species that you are trying to target. For example, if you're wanting to do supplemental shelter by using brush piles, you can't do that if you're managing for whitetail deer because whitetail don't use that as a shelter. But if you're managing for songbirds, you can use brush piles as a management tool. When you fill out the form for your management plan, you have to declare which species you are targeting for management, state your goals and objectives, and then choose three practices from seven categories that will benefit your target species. These categories are habitat control, erosion control, predator control, providing supplemental water, providing supplemental food, providing shelters, and performing census counts and surveys to determine the population of the targeted species. What we know is that wildlife do not adhere to human borders. And so by banding together with your neighbors and managing the habitat on a landscape scale can increase your effectiveness in providing that stability and that healthy holistic management for the greater ecosystem in your area. It can be just a simple partnership with your neighbor or it can be a partnership with a collection of your neighbors in creating a wildlife management association or a cooperative. This is a group of landowners that band together with common goals in mind to manage the greater wildlife population and their habitats. And then last but not least, I recommend that you have some patience, endurance, and adaptability. Wildlife management is a journey with a lot of things that you are having to react to that are out of your control. I'd call him and give him some recommendations and the weather conditions wouldn't work out. And he'd say, hey, it didn't work. What can we do? So we'd make another recommendation and go with it again. And so he was just really patient with that process and it paid off. It's been a labor of love. It's, it's been a quite a learning experience. You know, I learned something every year and I hope I keep learning. Texas Parks and Wildlife has a technical guidance program. We have biologists in every county in the state that can come out to your properties, discuss your management goals and objectives with you while also looking at the habitat that's on your properties. And we can use all of that information to help you develop a wildlife management plan.